Um, thank you guys for joining us. This is the Next Gen Web Pen Testing course uh, presentation. Yeah. Course. Jeez. A <laughs> uh, couple things to keep in mind. We are going to have a good time. Uh, I hope you guys do too. So uh, pretty much start with your bio. Start with me. Oh. Yeah. Ha -ha, your ha -ha. first. Me. So um, <laughs> my name is Jason Gillum. I am a principal security consultant for Secure Ideas. So I basically work for him. He'll introduce himself next. <laughs> that, guy. that guy. I am an IONS faculty member, which I think is pretty cool. Um, I got into security. I started off as a developer. We got developers in the crowd. Hopefully there's a bunch of you. Yeah, lots of developers. How about pen testers? We got those? So we got a bit of a mix. Almost an even mix, it looks like. Yeah. yeah. Good. All right, so uh, I, I'll tell you one thing. Getting into uh, uh, web app pen testing after being a developer uh, is pretty exciting because you have um, a good understanding of how stuff is, was originally designed. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that you're looking at. And um, uh, it's, it's much more fun to break things than it is to build them. So yeah. yes. it is. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. It's not a myth. Uh, so I, I, I still build stuff, though. Uh, a lot of it's uh, plugins um, for, well, I do plugins for Burp mostly. Um, and then there's a few other projects I'm involved in as well. In my free time, um, I'm a home brewer, and uh, when I'm have time, I, I run to to try to make up for the home brewing. So <laughs> I try. That works. Oh, here, let me forward that for you. Uh, yes, thank you. Ahead. Yeah. So I'm uh, Kevin. I work for him, and. <laughs> I'm the founder and CEO of Secure Ideas. That's the uh, easy way, formal way to say head nerd. Um, we started the company about six years ago by accident. Uh, I think that's important because I, I find it funny that I was, and I'm, I'm going to tell you guys this because I find it funny. I was just awarded the IT Council's Small Business Leader of the Year for 2017 in Jacksonville. And I find it absolutely hilarious because they're talking to me and they're like, okay, you're going to go and talk to these other business owners and, and tell them how to run a business. And I'm like, well, can I ask them how? Because I don't know how. We, <laughs> we just kind of made it for six years. Uh, a couple things to know, uh, and I'm going to throw it out there, and I know everybody is. We're hiring. We have two open recs right now for consultants, uh, and we're looking for salespeople. So if you know anybody who's looking for a job at the best company ever, yes. uh, they can apply somewhere else. If they'd like uh, a... <laughs> <laughs> we're modest. I, no, I, I don't think we're the best company, but I think we're pretty yeah, damn good, we're right? Darn good, yeah. yeah. I'm also an IONS faculty member, have been for about five years. I am a course author and instructor. I tell people that I'm an international instructor and speaker because I've taught in Australia once, right? <laughs> kind of like the Jacksonville International Airport. They have one flight to the Bahamas a week. And I was, I was talking in Jacksonville, and I had a guy say to me, we're an international airport. I'm like, really? Where's customs? And Atlanta isn't the right answer. But <laughs> I, I've talked at OWASP. I, I've taught here. I've spoken here. I, I black hat, all these kind of different things. Uh, we Just one thing to throw out there, if you know any veterans or first responders, they get free access to our training. All they have to do is reach out to us and ask. We'll send them a coupon code. They can sign up for it. Uh, I think that's very important, which is why I bring it up, right? So if you know anybody, please forward them over to us. And uh, I, <laughs> I have to bring this up because I'm proud of it. Uh, my wife says it's the nerdiest thing I've ever done. But I told her she met me when I was 26, so she doesn't know. Uh, I am a member of the 501st. So for the people who don't know, we are a charity group. We have 10,000 members worldwide. And what we do is we build and wear screen accurate Star Wars costumes to raise money for charity. We visit kids in children's hospitals, things like that. Uh, for example, right now, I am raising money because I'm going to do a 5K in full Vader costume. It's going to walk a 5K. I said do, <laughs> not run. <laughs> right? Just to clarify. So in the cloak, in the leather suit, all that kind of stuff, I'm going to do a 5K for arthritis. Uh, well, not to get arthritis, but to, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, right? So, oh, and I should warn you, um, I am full of tangents, and I have a sense of humor. Uh, notice I didn't say a good sense of humor. My current favorite joke is, do you guys know why Walmart wasn't hacked? They're not a target. But, 
So. <laughs> oh, that did not deserve applause. I, I got to introduce the CISO of Walmart, and I told that joke in his introduction, and he wouldn't shake my hand. <laughs> like, it was kind of fun, right? So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing today. We're going to talk about how to test web applications. And I know a lot of you are like, oh, testing web apps, I fire a burp, or I'm sorry, this is OWASP, so zap. But, uh, <laughs> so I'm going you know, to run Samurai WTF, whatever, right? And I'm going to intercept that traffic. But the reality is, web apps have changed, right? I still remember when I first built the, the very first website I ever built, and I won't even call it a web app, right? Uh, because it was HTML, gray background, black text, blue links, unless you clicked them, then they were purple, right? <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking, well, some of you do because you're old, but um, I, that's what we saw, right? And nowadays, the web applications, they're true applications, right? When I first started looking at HTML5, and saw that the idea of HTML5 was that it was no longer just a formatting language, it was now an application language. That you could run full-blown apps in your browser and be HTML5 compliant, right? That's mind-boggling to me, because I am old. I've been doing this for 25 years, and <laughs> I'm creaking, right? But development has changed, too. Right? We're agile now. I love that. I'm sorry. I've seen a lot of agile shops. There are way too many fat people in those rooms to be called agile. <laughs> <laughs> and I can admit to being that way, right? I can barely touch my, I can't touch my toes, right? How am I agile? But we see all this stuff, right? We're, we're building out this wild and crazy world. And, and when we start to look at things like Docker, AWS, you know, cloud, DevOps, let's talk about some more fancy buzzwords from today, but the reality is, is that security is changing. You know, I, I know that when I got involved in application security, when I first wrote the web pen testing course for SANS, um, we looked at applications and we could actually embed ourselves in the process to test every single deployment, right? Kinda. Nowadays, we have developers and development shops and companies bragging about how many deployments they do a day, right? A few years ago, I think it was uh, Netflix came out and said, we deploy 4,000 times an hour. I'm exaggerating, right? And, and they were like proud of this. Now, I don't know about you, but my immediate thought was, how bad is your code that you have to deploy <laughs> that often? But that's just my thought process, right? But when you're looking at a shop that is spinning up AWS instances as fast as anything, that is deploying code automatically out into packages and just randomly, oh, yeah, a new version of the code's out there. From a security perspective, this makes it very hard for us to test. On top of that, when you start to look at new technology, right? And I, and I bet you, you go out there and, and you look at the automated tools that can scan stuff, right? And the automated tool is going to come back and say, whoa, SQL injection, cross it, blah, 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 right? But the automated tool is going to fail on that single page app. It's going to fail on that app that uses WebSockets. It's going to fail on the application that is mostly client-side JavaScript, right? How do we handle that? How do we, as testers, as security people, as developers, ensure that what we do is right? We need to adapt, right? We need to be ready for this. And, and I want to be very clear, right? And I'll use HTML5 as the example because I've spoken about HTML5 before, right? Um, a lot of people think to themselves, I don't have to worry about this because we're not developing for HTML5 yet, right? My, my development shop isn't using it. Same thing with HTTP2, which is what we're going to talk about next, right? People are like, we don't have to worry about that because we're not deploying it. Yeah, but you may not be thinking about it, but the browsers support it and the developers are rolling it out, right? And when we're working in shops, we're developers, and I'm not making fun of developers here, right? I, my background is development. When we talk to developers who are just standing stuff up as they can, this is the kind of stuff they're doing, right? Because it's neat. And like us with pen testing, and I'll admit, right, my main focus today is hacking. I like it, right? I don't have to fix anything. I just get to tell you, you suck. It's not entirely true. It's not entirely true. You're <laughs> no. right. But it's fun to say, right? So when we look at HTTP2, let's talk about this real quick, right? HTTP2. How many people here 
have looked at AHP 1.1 request and a response from a server, right? Okay. Everybody Almost should raise everybody. their hand, right? If you've never looked at one, leave now and go look at one and come back. <laughs> It'll just take you a few seconds. They're really, really simple, right? HP 2.0 is a huge upgrade. It really is. Now, for us, most of it is performance enhancing. That sounds inappropriate. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> It's a big upgrade. Now, it is a platform upgrade. If you're an application developer, you are not writing an HTTP2 app, right? Your app hasn't changed. It's the platform, the Apache server, the, the Nginx server, whatever, that is changing. Those are now supporting HTTP2. The browser is now supporting HTTP2. But from the application perspective, you're still building your app. You're still responding with HTML and cascading style sheets and whatever, right? Uh, that hasn't changed. So when we look at, well, what has changed, right? So the high-level syntax, as I was just saying, is unchanged. We still have gets, we still have puts, we still have posts, delete, all that kind of stuff. The post parameters are still in the body. The get parameters are still on the URL. That high-level syntax is still exactly the same. That's why I say from an application development perspective, unless you're building the embedded platform, right, you're building the web server, you don't care about HTTP2 from your application development side, okay? What has been modified is the transportation layer, okay? And please, Nathan's gonna, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not talking OSI here. <laughs> We gave a, this talk at DerbyCon and one of our guys, Nathan, who is awesome and smart and loves to debate. Would debate be the right word? Argue. Debate. Argue, debate. It's a yeah. fine line with Nathan. He argued with us for a couple hours about the OSI level <laughs> layers, and it's like, that's not what I meant. So I'm adding that. Um, so transportation has been modified. We now have a binary protocol going back and forth that, is embed that has embedded in it the HTTP commands we know and love. Right? And it's designed with the idea that we want to speed up the user interface because if we're moving more and more of the application down to the user, right, we're having more of the processing happening at the application at the browser level, we have to get that data there as fast as possible, right? We want this to be a seamless interaction. We want it to feel like a desktop app, whatever. We have to get data down there fast. So what happens with HP2 is that the server now handles lots and lots of connections, right? You get one, one connection through and it's pushing data down. The server can actually pre-push data down to the browser. So if you ask currently in HP 1.1, right? You ask for a web page, you get an HTML response back. In that HTML response, there's an image tag here, an image tag there, a link to a cascading style sheet here. There's 87,000 JavaScript files that have to be loaded, about 85,000, right? And then those are requests afterwards, right? After that page has been parsed. With HTTP2, the server knows what, re request, what re uh, resources have to be pushed down to the browser. And so we can actually start handing those down to the browser before the browser asks for it. So when it asks for that original page, the server's already responding with, here's the images, here's cascading site, here's JavaScript, here's all this stuff. That's being pushed down to the browser instead of pulled with the 1.1 model. Okay, so it speeds things up. It makes things better. So how do we test this? <laughs> There's really two options, right? Because right now, currently, Zap and Burp, and you guys know Zap and Burp, right? They don't support HP 2.0. What happens when you make an HP request that is converted to 2.0 is you get a switching protocols message back, a, a 101 status code. So basically the server is saying to the client, hey, I support HTTP2, or H2 is what it looks like, right? It says, I support H2, and the browser says, you know what, hey, I support that too. Let's talk that. And so there's a switching protocol message. Burp and Zap block that. So when that 101 status code comes back, Burp discards it. And because all, currently, all HB 2.0 servers also support 1.1, Right? The server just continues to talk 
It, it, oh, okay, the, you can't switch protocols. We'll keep talking this way, right? So it doesn't know that the proxy server has blo blocked that. The browser doesn't know that a request was made to switch to it. And so you're continuing to work back and forth. So one way, you can downgrade to 1.1. That, like I said, the application is the same. So if I am testing your custom application running on your server, I don't care about the difference between 1.1 and 2.0 because I'm testing the app. I'm testing if you're vulnerable to SQL injection, cross-site scripting, stuff like that. So the downgrade to 1.1 is okay for me. Now, that's great for what? 95% of the pen tests we do. Okay, and I don't know, your, may, your numbers will be different. But what happens if we're testing an actual HP server implementation, right? It's an embedded system, IoT, Internet of Things, because the Internet wasn't of things before. But in that case, build a custom client. Right now, all good programming languages and Java support HTTP 2.0. So you can build a custom client to talk to it and fuzz that protocol, do whatever you want there. I personally, scapey. Yes. <laughs> right? It's awesome. But this is how you would test that. Now that is, I want to be very clear, that is only for testing the HTTP server. Right? You don't have to do, you can. Hey, you know, you, if you're Jason Gillum, you like writing clients, right? You can build a client for testing the application as well, but you don't have to, okay? Make sense? All right. WebSockets. WebSockets. WebSockets was a neat technology that was a brilliant idea, and very few people have used it. Uh, uh, to be very clear, very few industries have used it. There are certain industries that it's very heavily used. Uh, financial services being one, yeah, anywhere uh, where you, ha you need, actually need up to, up to the second live updates where you don't want to be polling, that's where you're going to find your web, web sockets in use, right? But you don't see a lot of web socket use on Twitter or uh, Google, whatever, right? Um, they can. Those are probably bad examples because somebody's going to go, no, 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 they are. Um, <laughs> so web sockets is a separate protocol from HTTP. Similar to HTTP 2.0, you get a switching protocol status message back. The application is able to say, hey, I want to start talking WebSockets. And WebSockets, like HP 2.0, is a binary protocol back and forth. It is absolutely readable, though. Um, you are going to see it, right? Now, testing it, which is what our main focus is, right? Testing it is supported in Zap and Burp, somewhat. And this is something that, that throws off a lot of people. Uh, I want to be clear. I'm a Burp person. Right? Uh, I prefer burp over zap. I want to. I want to make it absolutely clear, though, that it is nothing against zap. Uh, for some reason, every time I speak about burp, somebody reaches out to uh, Simon and says, "Kevin hates zap." I don't. It's the user interface. I learned burp first. It's what I'm comfortable with. It's like the age-old debate against iPhone and Android. Right? It's not that one is better than the other. It's just you're used to the user interface. The only uh, place where that argument is good is the VI versus Emacs debate. <laughs> and that's because we all know VI is best, right? Yeah. VI. But, <laughs> oh, I have somebody who doesn't agree. You're wrong. But, um, <laughs> so with Zap and Burp, total tangent, I told you. So with Zap and Burp, both of them support WebSockets somewhat. And I'm gonna use the example in Burp because it's what I'm most comfortable with. What happens is Burp will record all the WebSocket traffic. <laughs> it wasn't me. Gillum was pen testing the uh, food. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so what they do is there is a history tab now, WebSockets history. You know, like with the proxy history where you can see all the HTTP traffic? There's now a WebSockets history. And you can actually see and examine all of the requests and responses over WebSockets. You can also intercept a WebSocket request, modify it, and forward it on. None of the other tools in Burp work with WebSockets. So for the people here who are familiar with Burp, right, what do you do? Send it to repeater, right? 
munge around with it a little bit, forward it on, see what happens. Ooh, I get to do this, Whoa, right? That doesn't work with WebSockets. Intruder is the next thing we use, right? We throw it over to Intruder, we mark some parameters, we fuzz the heck out of it, we see what comes back. That doesn't work with WebSockets, right? So you have to keep this in mind as you're playing with it is, if any of you have ever heard me teach how to use Burp, you know that one of the first things I say is, turn off interception, right? Turn that off. Let's just use the browser. Let's proxy it. Let's capture it. Then let's use Repeater Intruder. With WebSockets, ignore that advice. With WebSockets, you want the interception on, right? If you're trying to mangle it. If all you want to do is record it, it'll do that fine for you. Make sense? OK? Zap it is a, I'll try that sentence again. Zap is in a similar place as Burp right now. Now, I do expect that both applications will start to support WebSockets further if either the industries that it's popular in, financial services, push for it, or we see a wider spread of WebSockets. I don't want to give you investing advice because I suck. I said the web was going nowhere because we had Gopher and bulletin board systems and stuff like that, so we didn't need the web. Um, I was right. The web never went anywhere. Uh, but I suspect that with HP 2.0 being as supported as it is right now, WebSockets will kind of not die away, right? Because people are still saying Flash is dead, and no, it's not. But uh, maybe it should be, but that's a different argument, right? Oh, it's on me now. Oh, totally. I get to talk. All right, you, <laughs> go ahead, take a break. So, uh, cross storage and resource sharing. Uh, this is something else that's come up in the last few years. Do we have a question? Yeah. So, so is Burp going to support HTTP2? HTTP2? Is, is Burp going to support HTTP2? You're going to have to ask David. I don't write Burp. Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't expect it to because it's such a different protocol. And Burp is really designed around, and I, I think the same thing about Zap, right? Um, both Burp and Zap are designed at testing the you know, the application on top of the protocol, not the protocol. So there's really no reason for them to, in, uh, to dedicate resources to supporting HTTP 2.0, right? Uh, because that's not what their focus is. Is that, is that another tool there? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going is deaf. Is there another tool? Like is, is there another Scapey, tool? right? Yeah. Scapey is an awesome way to test that. If you're going to test that embedded system, Scapey is. But keep in mind, remember that other option was to downgrade to 1.1, right? Burp and Zap will test an application that uses HP2. They'll just let it drop down to 1.1 .1 and everything will still work. Make sense? Okay. All right. I thought I was. I'm sorry. Oh, him? Oh. Here. <laughs> How about now? Is that better? He's Canadian, so he's very polite and I quiet. I am. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Thank you. Um, cores, cross-origin resource sharing. So I had to put some kind of Star Wars something on here as well. So I put that in for Kevin. And he's going to correct me and say that those aren't actually clones. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, same, same origin policy. This is, this is what cores is all about. Cores is a way around the same origin policy, or a way to build an exception to the same origin policy so that it makes the, uh, the HTML5 magic work, that mashups the, you know, you can have JavaScript running on one origin that goes out and fetches content and interacts with other sites. So um, that's what Cores is about. The um, same origin policy is relevant to, or what we're talking about is origins. So an origin is that combination of the uh, schema or protocol and the host and the port. So if any of those are different, then we're talking about a different origin, right? So you can have uh, two pieces of code running on, or two, two different uh, web servers running on the same actual host, but if they're on different ports, then they're actually considered two completely different origins um, from the perspective of any browsers that are looking at it. And the thing to keep in mind is it's the origin of the page that loaded the resource, yes. not the resource. So if you think about something like Google Analytics, right? How many people here have built a website using Google Analytics? And you load JavaScript, right? And your page loads in the browser, and it goes out to Google and pulls down the JavaScript 
the same origin policy treats that Google JavaScript as if it came from your site. The reason, the script tag that loaded it is what sets the origin. Where did that script tag come from, okay? So there are a couple of exceptions with the same origin policy. Um, one is there's a, there are a bunch of HTML, ex, uh, there's sort of exceptions, right? There's this gray area, um, and you just alluded to one. Like if I, if I have um, JavaScript source that I'm loading from somewhere else, or even images, or an iframe, those are all ways of loading stuff onto a page when that stuff comes from some other location, right? So that is sort of a way around the same origin policy uh, but it also is, each one of those cases is also has um, contained, there's rules around it. Like, for example, when you pull in uh, content from an iframe, you know that that content goes inside of basically a sandbox and it's still treated as a separate origin. You can't, the JavaScript can't interact directly with what's inside of an iframe, right? So uh, the other exception is the cross-origin re uh, cross origin resource sharing policy. I swear these acronyms are made of really long words just to mess with speakers. Yes, they definitely are. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you're doing a test, when, you, when we're doing a pen test, um, how do we actually find out if there is a course policy on something and how do we look at what it is? Um, so one option is um, if we're interacting with an application that is, um, is, is using a policy, then we should just see it in the proxy history, right? We should see um, those or cross origin requests, they still get made. Um, they might not be uh, considered in scope in some cases, right? You're gonna have your scope defined somewhere um, in Zap or in Burp. And so you have to make sure that you're looking, you wanna look at what's out outside of your scope as well. Um, but you're looking for those requests that actually have an origin header. Well, it's, I'll show an example of that in just a second. Um, your other option is to look at, um, or cons look at uh, an existing request to any of those servers and just throw your own origin header in there, right? So you can, you can force a response because the way the policy works is it's actually, it's defined on the server side, right? So this, uh, a, a server is gonna say, hey, I have a course policy. Um, and the way that it's going to know that it needs to respond to a request for a course policy is if the origin header exists in the request that's going over there, right? So in this case here, yeah, another Star Wars reference, I know. <laughs> so uh, we have uh, the origin is, is Camino. It doesn't matter what you put in as the origin. The server is going to respond with the access control allow headers the various different headers that um, are available to the course policy, right? So, um, and, and the way that, that this is going to work is, is if, this, if this server detects that, um, hey, the origin that's being requested is not one of the, one of the uh, origins that's in my list, well, it actually doesn't do anything at that point. It's not up to the server. The server just defines the policy. What happens, all happens on the browser side, the enforcement, right? So when this response gets back to the client side, to the browser, and it sees, wait, um, I'm, I just sent a request from the origin Camino, but um, the policy from the server actually says it, access control allow origin is for OWASP.org in this case. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna process this request. And so what happens is the JavaScript, is these are all JavaScript requests, uh, the JavaScript will um, basically dump into its exception state, right? It's not going to process this as a, as a success, as a, a successful request response interaction. Now, one of the things to look at on here, see how it says access control allow credentials true. Um, if you haven't seen one of these before, it might not be what you're thinking. Um, what it means is it's actually, do you want me to send cookies? Are, are cookies allowed? Um, that's basically what that means. All right. So uh, let's say um, we have one website, Secure Ideas, and we have another website, uh, OWASP, and OWASP has some content on it that we want to be able to access through a uh, course policy. 
Um, what we're going to do is we're going to construct that request and, and send it over with the origin secure ideas. And then the access control out origin would come back um, OWASP.org. Um, and um, let's, or let's, let's say, actually, let's say uh, access control allow origin rather is, is uh, allows secureideas.com on the OWASP site. Um, so then that one's actually allowed to proceed. If access control allow credentials is also true in that same request as it's, as it's stated here, um, and the rest of the policy holds, then that means any cookies for OWASP.org that are active in the browser that are still valid will be sent along with that request. Okay, so there is a bit of a handshake that actually occurs. Um, okay, so one of the biggest um, misconceptions for the CORE's policy is uh, the use of the global policy. So let me just back up just for a second here um, and see access control out origin. That can be a star. So if that is a star, it is Sorry, not the same as um, the flash cross-domain policy. It doesn't mean the same thing exactly. So in flash, uh, flash cross-domain policy, that basically means if you put star on there, anybody can interact with it. Same thing with cores. That means anybody can interact with it. But that also means that the other parts of the policy, and specifically those that relate to sending cookies across, um, the, the access control allow credentials, uh, those will will always be false. So it's impossible to actually set a course policy as global and also have cookies being sent to that location. So there's that sort of that built-in, um, I guess, idiot-proofing protection that's in there. So. This was a few years ago. Uh, we did a talk about weaponized Flash where we discussed that having a global policy in crossdomain.xml would allow malicious users to build Flash objects to attack your users using your application. We actually built and released a proxy through Flash because of this, right? That's why this is bad in Flash. In cores, it doesn't work the same way. This isn't a big deal. Right. And one of the reasons I bring this up, too, is because you'll actually find that some of the automated scanners out there, they'll see the global um, policy on there, and they will immediately say, hey, wait, this is a big issue. You know, go fix this. There's something wrong. You know, you shouldn't use a global policy. And that's actually not true. Uh, global policy, as far as core is concerned, is usually okay. So the pen test considerations, the first one, like I said, the global policy, is if the resources that are on the, um, that are being shared through cores, if those resources are things that are, um, are meant to be public, then you're fine with a global policy. It's not an issue. Right. Um, if those resources are things that, for some reason, are, are not meant to be uh, public, you know, there, there's an expectation that you would log in for that, then there's probably something wrong with the way these applications are written because we already know that the credentials, access uh, allow credentials is not going to work. So, um, The second point on here is, is the most important one. Cores is a way to build an exception to the cross to the um, same origin policy, right? It builds an exception into that. It actually expands the scope of that of that policy. It kind of wraps it around another um, another set of origins. So that what that means is any cross-site scripting vulnerability on the requesting page can be used to attack the the um, resource the origin that has the resources that are being shared. Okay, so when you're setting up a course policy if on the development side, if you're setting up a course policy, make sure that you actually trust those origins. You, you actually trust that they're doing proper pen testing, that they actually have secure code, that they don't have any cross-site scripting on their site. Because if they do, they can use the cross-site scripting on their site to attack your site. Because their JavaScript can interact with your content. And right. keep in mind that many times that other origin, you don't have rights to test. Right, So it's not like you can just say, hey, I allow this origin. Let me go pen test it myself to see if it's yeah. safe. Okay, A lot of times you, you don't have that permission. Right. Um, and, and the last one is just, um, I guess, kind of a corner case. But if you can come up with ways to, um, to man in the middle some of the traffic, 
then you may be able to use um, the existence of a, of a CORS policy to um, basically downgrade a request to HTTP, just like you could with any other request. Right. So let's move on to RESTful APIs. RESTful APIs. I'd like a REST. <laughs> um, NAPs are so nice. That's a total tangent, but I like NAPs. <laughs> Um, I don't get them very often, but I like them, right? So RESTful APIs, how many people here played with SOAP? Good, you all babes today. <laughs> so a lot of people tie RESTful and SOAP together, but really the thing to keep in mind is that SOAP is a protocol. There's actually a format to it and everything else like that, whereas RESTful is an architectural style, okay? It's a we agree to use requests that match this style, okay? So we still use puts, deletes, gets, posts, all that kind of stuff. But we've all agreed, well, they told us what we agreed to, right? That when we say get, we're pulling data. When we're posting, we're executing a transaction. When we're putting, we're putting data, right? Things like that. Um, so RESTful is just this architecture. Now, this becomes very important as pen testers. Right, because when we look at something like SOAP, I can hit that SOAP endpoint, I can ask for a WSDL, I get a declaration of all the endpoints that I can talk to, all the functions I can call, and the format I wanna send those requests in, right? And while yes, it's an ugly format because it's XML, right? Because why do anything in four bytes when you can do it in 12 meg? But <laughs> um, the, the reality is I know how to test that very, very easily. Right, because I know how to parse that WSDL. There, there is no WSDL for REST. There is no endpoint that I can talk to unless the developer built one, right? That's a, that's a custom thing, right? The uh, you are here map in the application. So as a pen tester, I know how to test it. The, the, it's still HTTP, right? I can still mangle the, post parameters, I can still mangle the request, I can see what comes back. The problem becomes, how do I know all of the endpoints? Especially since RESTful is supposed to be stateless, right? So as I interact with it, I should be able to just bang up against any part of this RESTful API and it will interact with me, right? So how do I find out those endpoints? As a pen tester, the answer is focus on the client. We, by the way, as we move to more and more modern applications, you're gonna see that title way more often. And the reason is, like we said at the very beginning, more and more of the application is in the client, so we have to focus on the client. It's, it's no longer as nice, right? Uh, ooh, I put a single quote here in the database error, it comes back and that's awesome, right? A lot of this stuff is running on the client. And so with this, what we start to do is we start to think about, okay, who is consuming this API? Well, it's another application, right? It's a client application, it's another server application, whatever. If I focus on that client application and during my testing, right, I do a mapping phase, if I'm following the right methodology, right? And during that mapping phase, I should be using the entire application normally. Poking at all the buttons, submitting all the things, right? Testing all the stuffs. And I should be able to capture all of the requests and responses that are going back and forth. And from those requests and responses, I should be able to then figure out what all the endpoints are. Now, keep in mind, that you only have access to the endpoints this way, you're only gonna map the application endpoints that you interact with. So for example, a lot of times when you're doing a pen test, right, you get credentials, either you stole them or you were given them, and that set of credentials doesn't necessarily have access to everything. Another thing that we see quite often when we test APIs is that when the API was rolled out, it had 27 endpoints. But then the developer decided to move stuff around and now they have five endpoints, but they didn't get rid of the other endpoints, they're just sitting there. But the client side application doesn't interact with them anymore, right? So you have these endpoints that are exposed, but you don't see them, okay? But you wanna start there. You wanna start looking at, okay, what's, what's out? There's also special clients for this, right? There's the advanced REST client, there's Postman. Uh, there's also, how many people here use SOAP UI, right? 
So I am totally bothered by the fact that a tool called SOAP UI interacts with RESTful APIs. It's just, it bothers my OCD, I can't handle it, right? It should be called REST UI. That's just my opinion, right? Um, but when you look at these apps, they will interact with those RESTful APIs for you. And what we do is we tell these apps to go through the same proxy, burp, zap, whatever, that we're going to in our normal usage of the application, and now we can capture the requests and responses the same way we capture the requests and responses from the normal stuff. This also helps us, another thing to do is when we say focus on the client, remember that you have a client, right? I can call my customer up and say, hey, I'm testing this API, can you send me the documentation that you give to somebody who is consuming this, right? If it's a public API that other organizations use, then it should be uh, documented. Another thing that you can do is you can ask the developers, give me your test cases, right? So if you're using SOAP UI, send me your SOAP UI tests. And I can look at those tests and determine what the requests look like. That helps to find the things that aren't interacted with at your user level or at the application because things have been retired. Is your hand up for the question or? Okay. I, I, very, very sorry. I'm old and deaf. Swagger, swagger, hospitalist swagger. It's a Jason Pollard has I've never looked at that. I've never even heard about it. And if it's awesome, I have to, right? Okay, it's called swagger. Yeah, swagger. Have you heard of this? No, I might have. Yeah. Really? Man, no. Really? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'll know about it tonight, though. <laughs> Absolutely. See, I've just never seen it. I've, I feel like an idiot now. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> so, uh, when you test, right, here are some things to really think about. Now, obviously, the fourth one, duh, fuzzing, right? Like, you should be doing that no matter what. But what we see a lot of times is with APIs, authentication is bad, right? Authentication authorization is bad. Uh, a lot of people go way overboard on the stateless idea. Right? I actually had a developer once argue with me that because it was stateless, they weren't allowed to authenticate the users. Okay, as a pen tester, I appreciate that. Thank you. Just run it on SharePoint. But, uh, so one, authentication, right? Two, session management. How is session state being handled between the application and this API that's also being consumed? Right? Especially when what you're looking at is a web app that's pushing JavaScript down and the JavaScript is interacting with that RESTful API, session state has to be maintained between those two systems. Right? So look at that as a tester. Is it being handled correctly? Right? Can you play in that area? And finally, because I already talked about the fuzzing, where's the data? What data are you getting? Where is it being stored, right? Way too often we see that the, the API request will go up and the API will go, here is every bit of data you possibly need, right? And then the client-side application parses it. Uh, Gilliam and I are working, <laughs> this is, I, yeah, right? <laughs> we're gonna embarrass the customer, we're not gonna name them. Um, Bill, no, I, <laughs> so uh, we had a customer, and Gilliam and I were out on location and we're talking to the customer and we're really just doing this, Hey, dude, what you doing? Right, like I say, dude, way too often for somebody who doesn't surf. But, um, like, hey, how does this work? What? Do you, and the guy's talking about his app. And basically, what the app did was you got a token. And by token, I don't mean like technical token. I mean like here's a number, right? You're 43. And then you make a request to the site, and the site would go, Hey, 43, I know you. I need to vet that you're you though. So I need you to ask. I need you to answer some very, very secret questions. So when did you own a Renault Encore? Or what year did you live on Elderberry Court, right? Whatever, by the way, I just gave you two answers to my secret questions. But, uh, <laughs> so it was like, it would ask these questions, right? And I said to the guy, hey, instead of just describing to you, do you mind, do you, this is in production, right? Do you mind just letting me browse to it through Burp so I can just see the interaction and, and start to go? And the guy said, yeah, sure, no problem. And the guy was very, very proud of his security. This guy was the smartest person you will ever meet. He's smarter than all of you, me, all combined, right? And he goes, yeah, no problem. So we fire up Burp, and I make the initial request, and I get a response that's quite large. Because what it did was it dumped down 
all of the questions and all of the data about the user. So this is Kevin Johnson. He was born February 27, 1973. His social security number is? Gotcha. And um, so right, like all of this data, every bit of the questions right, was dumped down as part of a RESTful response to Quite the browser. Right application, right? It was a client-side application. <laughs> so I looked at it, and I will admit that when I was looking at it, I'm like, no. <laughs> I mean, this guy's been talking about security. Like, he really knows what he's talking about, right? And I, I go, kill him. Look at this. And I slide the laptop over, and? <laughs> no, there's no way he would have done that. <laughs> That's exactly what he had done, I, right? I, yeah, I said that out loud, too. Yeah, yes, he did. <laughs> we were in the room, and it's like, no, there's no way. So. Uh, oh, yeah, content security policy. So um, working on a pen test, you find what definitely looks like a possible cross-site scripting vector. Yes. You go to do your alert pop-up box, and it, for some reason, is not working. <laughs> so you go checking around in your logs, in your browser log, uh, and you might find that uh, you've been denied because of the content security policy. So CSP is this kind of... I was just going to throw out... Yeah. I was just throw out the, the description. This is the whole idea of browsers <laughs> deciding that we're too dumb to use the Internet. <laughs> right? So Firefox, Mozilla, they're going to know better than we do, so they're going to lock things down. Yep, that's pretty much it. So let me just kind of skip through this here. Uh, so versions, there's a bunch of, there's several versions. It's been around for a while, right? 2012. Um, CSP1, uh, CSP2 is has been around for, um, I guess, a, over a year, almost two, two years, years now. now? Yeah. Um, but it's not overly implemented. I actually have a, a, a list of uh, browser support um, in a couple of slides here. Uh, and CSP3 is, is currently in a, it's in a draft. So it's, it is a, um, the point is the content security policy is something that is evolving and we should be, should be on the lookout for it and developers should actually look at probably adopting it more. I know that, um, I think I've run into it once in a pen test in the last year. I, th I, I can think of two. You, you had two? Yeah. And I'll tell you, there was a great lightning talk this morning about CSP that dug really deeply into the different features and how in 1.0 it had this feature, in 2.0 that was deprecated, and then in 3.0 the feature came back and stuff like that. So check that out if you missed it this yeah. morning. I don't want to go through all of that here. We yeah, no. Time. no. So, um, so basically what we're looking for from a pen test is we want to see is there um, a response header that's coming back that just says content security policy and is there a, and or is there a uh, HTML meta element somewhere on the page that, um, that also has a content security policy in there as well. And that, that will define the policy. Basically what it's going to do, um, there are a lot of different combinations of things you can do with the content security policy, but the, uh, I guess in a nutshell, for those of us who are, are pen testing, um, the main thing it does is it helps control where uh, JavaScript source can be loaded from. It'll allow you to control where other things can be loaded from as well. But uh, the main thing that we're interested in within the context of cross-site scripting is where is JavaScript allowed to be loaded from? And often one of the, case, one of the places it, it uh, can't be loaded from is going to be inline. So when we try to do that reflected cross-site scripting, we try to get uh, our alert pop-up box to kind of come back to us on the page. Uh, the content security policy, the browser is going to look at the policy, say that, see that it's there, and prevent us from moving forward with that. Question all the way in the back. Well, you're absolutely right, that if there's a if there's a bug in the content security policy, the browser will ignore the entire policy, right? Which is great for us as pen testers. It's <laughs> absolutely something that you need to test if you're developing, right, uh, for this type of stuff. All right, so browser support. Uh, where we are right now, uh, your best bet is to use CSP1. And I just pulled this directly off content-security-policy.com, which is a pretty good site with a lot of... Um, information about it. It's not my website, but we'll just move on from there. I think we're running well on time. So. Yeah. <laughs> and then the part that I love and I'm embarrassed by because we're not done yet. <sighs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. Samurai 4.0. How many people here have played with Samurai WTF? 
awesome. If you ever want to have fun, come interview at Secure Ideas. And when you're done with your interview, say to me, hey, by the way, do you guys ever use Samurai? Because I love that thing. The guy had no idea that I had built it. <laughs> I'm like, I thought it was a joke. Not because I think Samurai is so famous or I'm so famous. Just if you're going to interview at a company, go check out their website. Right? He knew he was interviewing with me. Read my bio. It says it. But Samurai WTF was built a while ago. I created it, uh, geez, two, uh, 2008. Um, it was when it was first released. Uh, Samurai WTF was built because I was bored. I missed DEF CON that year. Um, I was supposed to go to DEF CON, then a client said, hey, you want to go here? I'm like, okay, so I canceled my DEF CON trip. Uh, then at the last minute, the client canceled the engagement. But my family had gone out of town because I wasn't going to be there anyways. So they're out of town. I'm sitting in a house by myself. I don't know about you, but when I'm bored, I build Linux distributions, right? <laughs> so um, we built Samurai back then. Uh, Justin Searle, who all of you should know. If you don't know Justin, you're missing out. He's awesome, right? Uh, but Justin and I worked at In Guardians together, built out the first few releases. He's continued to maintain it with us. Uh, Gillum has been added to the project. And basically, it was a live environment. It was an ISO that you could burn to a CD. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? And then boot. Then it was a DVD. Then it got booted. And then I got lazy because we hit a point where the tool I was using to build the ISOs was no longer supported. And there's a way to build ISOs in Ubuntu, and I'm an idiot and can't figure out how to make it work, right? And I have a real job. So uh, almost everybody we talked to used it as a VM anyways. So now we release a virtual machine. There is one guy who is obscenely irate on our ticketing system every so often because uh, he doesn't like it. And my answer to him is, no, Gillum had a very nice answer, which I won't repeat now. But uh, my answer to him is, hey, it's an open source volunteer project. If you want an ISO, build it, right? And we will absolutely release it from that way, from then on. I just haven't had the time to fix it. But it is a VM based on Ubuntu. 4.0 is based on 16.04 LTS. What we did, we decided about a year, two years ago, that the uh, major version would only upgrade with the LTS version of Ubuntu. Because the first few versions of Samurai, after a few months, <laughs> Ubuntu was no longer supporting that version, and so you couldn't patch it, you'd have to upgrade. Um, so we're, if it's 4.0 is 16.04, 5.0 will be based on the next LTS version. What's that, four years from now, three years from now? I don't remember, I never remember, right? It is two gigs of RAM, about 15 gig of hard drive space, you can install it on a VM, right? Now with 4.0, we've changed our model somewhat. Right? First, how many people here have played with Mobisec? Right? It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> it's part of Samurai 4.0. What we realized is we were maintaining two live environments in a VM that crossed over so much it wasn't even funny. Right? So what we're doing is we're taking all of the work we did on Mobisec under the DARPA CFP, CFT and moving it into Samurai. So Samurai will be a web and mobile testing environment within 4.0. That's the first very big thing. We're also, by the way, adding mobile targets to Samurai, right? Because the other thing we're doing is Samurai has long been known as a pen testing environment, but really what we want you to use it for, look, I don't mind you using it for pen testing, but really what we want you to learn, use it for is learning, training, understanding, because I am a very firm believer. I have a business goal. I joke around and say that my business goal is to be protested by the Occupy movement, right? That's how you know you're successful. There's pup tents in your cul-de-sac. But the reality is my business goal is to go out of business. If I do my job right, if Gillum does his job right, you don't need us, right? And Samurai is one of the efforts for that. Because if we can teach you how to do what we do, one, you don't need us to do it. Two, two, when you do hire us, we no longer have to deal with finding search boxes that are vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Look, we're not the most expensive consultants out there, but that's a waste of your money. If you couldn't put script alert XSS in a search box and go, oh, damn, that's broke, right? 
So we want you to learn this, okay? So it's a training environment. On top of that, we're moving something we've been working on for way too damn long, excuse me, right? We're Packages, we are getting there. We are. We've been talking about this since version like negative four of Samurai, is that instead of you downloading a full ISO or a full VM, what you'll be able to do is install an Ubuntu environment and then say apt get install Samurai WTF. That's our goal. Right? And we'll be able to say apt get install Samurai WTF targets or whatever. That is what we're moving to. Okay? And then finally, the last main difference is we're finally modernizing Dojo Basic. So what we're doing is we're putting, because it's a training environment, right? We're putting all of these very, very hardcore violent, uh, violent, right? Uh, I don't know where violent came from. I meant vulnerable. But um, those words are exactly the same. Ask, I don't know, um, Hillary Trump. But that way we cover both, <laughs> right? Everybody's offended. But uh, so what we're doing is we're modernizing Dojo Basic. A this, target this, by application. the way, is, this is a... Screenshot of the current version, the old version. Yeah, I was going to say. Right now, so yeah, I'm just drooling myself. But <laughs> we're going to add CSP. We're going to add the stuff we talked about in this session is going to be part of Dojo Basic. So you'll be able to see how to test these things because one of the things we found is we talk to developers because keep in mind, right? We can joke and say that our job is awful, awesome because we get to come in, hack you, tell you you suck, and leave. But the reality is our job is to make you better right? And help you. So we don't just come in and kick developers, even though sometimes I'd like to, right? What our job is, is to show them how to fix it, how to make it better. And one of the limitations, as we've looked at these modern applications, these RESTful APIs, all of this client-side stuff, is that there's no really good vulnerable app that we've been able to find that can show the vulnerabilities these modern technologies will do. And that's why we're modernizing Dojo Basic. Okay? So at that point, we're going to say thank you very much. I am going to say we're going to be around today and tomorrow. Anytime, just walk up, ask us questions. Tomorrow, we should have professional evil stickers with us if you want them. I'm going to reiterate the if you know any vets or first responders, they get free training from us. And don't forget to put the green cards in the, the slot. The green card is the right one. Not the red card. Ignore the color of our logo. <laughs> Use the other one. <laughs> thank you, everybody.